was a boy, my father and I stood here overlooking the Mississippi River Valley of Southeast Missouri, and he said, when I was your age, Bill, there were cypress trees as far as the eye could see in all directions. Just one of the many stories about the good old days we've all grown up to cherish of what now may lie within ruin of America's heartland, but we're going to bring it all back to life right here on The Creative Connection. It was a great undertaking by engineers and landowners to carve out a map in the Earth's surface, allowing the waters of the Blue Hill Plain of southeast Missouri to drain into the Mississippi River by constructing a series of floodway canals leading to the southern border and a diversion channel to collect the headwaters from the northern plateau. As time passed, the swamp was drained, leaving the timber for the lumber and building industry. The farmland, as a result, became some of the richest in the nation producing a wide variety of crops where cotton ruled as king and still remains a trump card among the cash crops. As progress continued, it eventually led us into the mainstream of industrialized America, where greater opportunity awaited as we closed the door on hard work farm life seemed to have offered in substitute of a more leisure way of life, where no one today can be found innocent of saying, when I leave here, I'm never coming back. So if not for the cooperative efforts from the landowners of southeast Missouri, the history of my homeland would have been left unchanged, consisting of not much more than a few settlements that had taken root along an old pole road leading through the swamp. I've always wondered what that old road must have looked like as it still exists beneath the surface of its beginning at Little River in the town of Bokerton, where in this painting it's covered with gravel, adorned with an iron bridge, just as I recall it growing up. But to recreate the likeness of the road today, as it looks soon after its construction, we'll have to go further back in time with our imagination amid the folklore where only some of the facts may be found. As the story would have it, those cypress timbers are still below the surface of the road today, just as good now as they were then. When I told my daddy this, he said, what do you mean cypress timber? That road was made from cypress poles, laid parallel on top of one another. Then planks were nailed on top of the poles so that they could support the weight of the loads. Everything about those trees was valuable. Nothing was wasted. Well, to hear him tell it, his road would have looked a bit rougher than the one I'm making considering the fact he was a subsistent farmer, or one who lives off the land, which was once a common practice throughout America. But to settle in an area known as the Missouri Boot Hill literally meant living on top of a crack in the earth, better known as the New Madrid Fault. Since the Pole Road had been built only 44 years after the New Madrid earthquake of 1811, I'm sure many of those that survived moved on to greener pastures. It stands to reason there would be no better material than cypress to build such a road, spanning some 40 miles. After all, it was lightweight and a firm texture, easy to work with, and above all, it was insect resistant and wouldn't rot. Being evident in some of Missouri's barns that occasionally dot the landscape today, just as good now as they were then. Since the road was built primarily for hauling freight, there may have been a collection hut or perhaps a rest area to readjust the load and get a drink from a dipper in a bucket left sitting on a table alongside a primer pump, which puts a new spin on today's pump your own issues. We may find ourselves having a more practical mind's eye view while exploring this realm of creativity, still adapting to change as the good old days reflect upon our success to think what a wonderful golf course this could make until reminded of the mosquitoes or what may lie in wait around the corner in search of a lost ball. It's been said they stood on the backs of mules in order to cut down the trees and that the road was burned during the Civil War, not to mention which side burned it, although it was suspected the bushwhackers, not the kind Hollywood defines in their movies, but as Webster defines as being those individuals having the position 
of pulling a boat along through a swamp, tugging at the lower limbs of bushes and trees. To recreate a road like this from memory or your imagination, it helps to have a basic understanding of drawing in perspective. We've all heard of the vanishing point where two parallel lines meet to form one point in the distance, like a pair of railroad tracks would appear. This can also be referenced as the eye level line, or the point at which the eye becomes level to the horizon, allowing us to recognize what part of an object lies above and below eye level. In order to bring out the proper perspective of how the road should look, it helps to define where your position is in relation to where the road should appear. In this case, the finished product indicates that you would be standing on the left edge of the road, looking straight off into the distance. Where in a sense, lighter colors may appear closer, having a tint, along with the shade of darker colors, in the distance. Ultimately, we are to be rewarded as the painting nears completion by truly identifying how the old pulled road would have looked, winding its way through such a wilderness of apparent wealth. To revisit the area today where the old pulled road winds through the small town of Bogerton, there would be very little, if any, evidence to prove that the town was once a thriving community, equipped with a schoolhouse, a church, and a store, where just around the corner, down the lane from the blacksmith shop, was our house. As I turned down the lane for the first time in a long while, it was as if time had stopped just for me to hear a small voice say, you can't go back home. As the good old days may reflect upon our experiences, no matter where they may originate, to see a photograph or some other visual interpretation leaves us with a warmer feeling for what we can't go back in time to relive. So I've decided to recreate the old home place from memory, just as it was soon after I was born. As we can see from these sketches, the overall perspective looks correct. If we wanted to find the eye level line, well, it lies about halfway between the window facings, as it connects to the line of the horizon. Now let's go on to the fun part of bringing the old home place back to life. We generally begin by painting the background in first, and then proceed to the foreground, accompanied by more details. This is called working from the general to the specific. When working from memory, it's a good idea to determine which direction the light is coming from. Shadows put in the right place can become important details, allowing the perception of greater depth. This is especially important when painting with watercolor because the proper technique relies heavily upon highlight, core, and reflected light, as well as shadows. I'm using acrylic paint for this project, mainly because it dries fast. You can paint over it, and it's not likely to become muddy. If you want to compare it to oil paint, if nothing else, it'll clean up a lot quicker, without all those toxic fumes. For the most part, it comes down to what you prefer as all the different mediums of painting certainly have an application to the preference of your technique. Masking tape often becomes a handy tool when the elements of shape and form take on a more linear nature, specific to the geometry of the house. Although it may be cumbersome and rather awkward at times, patience is generally awarded a surprise by the difference it can make. My four brothers and sisters were born here in this house, except me. They said I was born in the clinic. Years later, when they all moved away and had families of their own, I asked my dad why I was born in the clinic and not at home. He said, Bill, you weren't born in a clinic. You were born on the way to the clinic. It was getting late, and by the time we got there, close to midnight, none of us had a watch so we didn't know if it was the 17th or the 18th. Well, that's your story. You can tell it that way. I know because I was there. Then I said, well, why did they say I was born in a clinic? He said, well, it was during a time when the ladies were taking on leadership roles in the community, and it was becoming more common for babies to be born in clinics. Well, since you couldn't wait, and you were all right, we just took you back home and nobody ever knew the difference. 
One of the most unusual things about returning home was the absence of ambient sounds, such as the loud, repetitive clink of the blacksmith's shop hammer down at the end of the lane. But the most familiar sound in the community was one made when crossing the Iron Bridge over Little River just at the edge of town. I remember us kids coming home from school on Fridays, hungry for a snack. Friday was Mama's grocery day. Well, I'd have it figured to be first in line if I knew exactly when she'd be coming home. And the old iron bridge always gave her away. It had a certain rhythmic sound of wood on metal that put a ring in the echo relative to the speed when crossing the bridge. That way I could shoot a few hoops with everybody else, then slip inside right before she got home, and in a little while they'd be walking in carrying all the groceries. Well, it always put me first in the baker's pie. All too often in our eagerness to seek out the reward of effort put forth, we may become lax to the initial feeling of accomplishment, putting the work aside to say, I'll finish up another time. Given the fact the delay can befall the best of us under any circumstance, the painting most likely will never reach fruition, becoming a broken relic of our good intentions, possibly taking it to the point of asking, when do you know the last stroke of the brush has been taken to claim the work complete, when the answer can only be when the work is done. Here on The Creative Connection, we often make comparisons to the craft of songwriting, where finishing is of utmost importance. Otherwise, a song may become just another good idea, hopefully not for someone else to finish. Providing the work has been finished, as in our case, it's important to note framing is a craft in itself, requiring special tools, not to mention the individual having an eye for coordination of colors. Though we may think we can do everything well enough to bring our creative endeavors in view of the critic, I've grown to accept the premise there's always someone who can do it better. However, it pays to endure to the end. So with a little more definition to the hedgerow and a few accessory plants added to the roughness of the grass, our painting of the old home place indeed has come back to life, in which case I can acclaim I've never seen it looking so good. The dream of those who envisioned such a grand harvest became our way of life, as the text will imply surpassed by the likes of no other. How lucky for us to be the generation reaping all the benefits. After all, they had to walk five miles to school each morning, through the rain and snow, then jump round, turn around, pick a bale of cotton when they got back home. Pick a bale a day. If their story was true, and if the cotton made two bales to the acre, they would have to pick six of these rows during the course of an eight-hour day, and their eight-hour day would last from sunup to sundown. Makes you wonder what they'd have thought beating one of these babies on the way to school, picking six rows at a time. First picker I know was one row picker. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was when, uh, when we'd all stand over in cotton sacks and end the guy right. and grab it. Yep. And back then, we'd pick the ends off the hand. Can't tell it short between well, the tractor and that way. We used to pick cotton at least twice and sometimes three times. And we I see. Now we pick it one time, let's start. And it's over with. That's it. Despite the difficulty of the task, there were some fond memories, like riding on top of the cotton in the trailer on the way to the gin, looking up at the moon and stars as if floating on a cloud. I'll never forget, I was just a kid having a cotton sack made of a burlap bag. Mom had sewn up with a red guitar strap. We were waiting in the truck as the cotton was being processed, vacuumed up through this large stovepipe apparatus operated by a man who happened to be mute and deaf when all of a sudden it dawned on me I had left my cotton sack in the trailer. Mama said, you better go tell him. I replied, how on earth can I do that? He can't hear. In a reassuring way, she said, oh, I think he'll understand. I proceeded to climb the trailer and by the time I got his attention, I think he already knew, as if it weren't the first time it happened. He gave me the okay sign and I gave it back and I fell asleep on the way home with a remote possibility he wouldn't find it. Well, the next day, 
I was right there in line with the rest of them, fence row to fence row. The cotton trailers today, called bull buggies, never leave the farm operation, hauling as much as five bales at a time from the cotton picker to the module builder, where an operator controls a hydraulic stamping mechanism that packs the cotton into another trailer, designed to pull away from the packed module, leaving it there on the end row with a tarpaulin placed on top to shed water. Any damage caused by the weather when left in this position is considered minimal. Most of the time, the trucks from the cotton gin come pick it up soon after the modules are built, as the entire operation moves to another location, becoming a mobile factory roaming about the community in a non-stop fashion until the harvest is complete. Lucky for us indeed to be the generation who dreamed of a better way, this 250-acre field has yielded the equivalent of some 500 bales of cotton in an eight-hour day where in yesterday's good old way of thinking, they would still be out there in the field with at least another hour until sundown. To say the family farm no longer exists may be an understatement, considering the fact tomorrow's agricultural producer will plant his field and make the harvest without leaving the house. That's about as close to home as you can get. But regardless of the circumstances, the good old days present a reality check and humor of events we all have in common, where we do indeed find ourselves looking back from another time in a different place, much like the character in the song who can't seem to loosen his grip on the bond he has with the land, as if to say you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. As the song sings to the world, offering his vision of a dream come true, in view of our own recollection of the good old days. Back when I grew up in the land of cotton where I planned to leave counting the days if I wound up higher than wolf by you, I'd only come back in dreams of yesterday. Every once in a while, every now and then, I want to go back. Just to be home again In another time In a different place I'll dream my way back To the good old days The old Poles Road is a blacktop highway. The Pokerton Church, it's still the same. There's not much more than a patch of clover where the home place stood. And the cotton now lays Every once in a while Every now and then I want to go back Just to be home again In another time In a different place I'll dream my way back to the good old days. I'll dream my way back to the good old days. I'll dream my way back to the good old days.